Hey everybody, I want to talk about a product and platform that I absolutely love and our latest sponsor, Interseller, the prospecting and outreach platform of choice for recruiters and sellers. Whether you're doubling down on business development or recruiting talent, Interseller does all the heavy lifting of finding contact data, automating the email and follow-up process, and syncs all that rich data into 20 plus CRM and ATS platforms. Reach out now and get going on a two-week free trial and let them know you heard about it from Adam on the podcast today. Check out the link on the website. Appreciate it. Welcome to the podcast, where we introduce you to incredible humans who share their journeys with the mission to inspire you to harness your own inner tenacity to drive your life and career forward. And now, your host, Adam Posner. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the podcast where I bring you the best and the brightest from the world of business, marketing, and entrepreneurship to help you harness your inner tenacity and drive your career forward. My guest today is a serial entrepreneur and author, Brian Scudamore. At just 19 years old, Brian began his disruption of the professional junk removal industry when he created 1-800-GOT-JUNK. And I'll pause that because I got some junk to remove. <laughs> turning a chore people avoid into an exceptional customer service experience and what it's all about. Then he scaled that success into two more home service brands. Well, one day painting and not Shake Shack, but Shack Shine under the O2E brand banner. And Brian learned the ins and outs of business by running his own and believes that anyone with a fire in their gut and a vision for doing something incredible with their future could do the same. And he details the philosophies in his book, WTF, which stands for willing to fail. And it stems from his belief in the power of dreaming big, taking risks, and learning from mistakes. Now through franchising, he's giving thousands of aspiring entrepreneurs a chance to live their dreams of business ownership. And that's a mouthful. So let's get to it right to the conversation to Mr. Self-Made Himself, Brian. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Adam. Happy to be here. Awesome. Good stuff. And I'm thrilled to have you here. And greetings to all my friends up in the great North Canada. Thrilled to have you on the show today. So let, let's start. You know, you and I were talking before the show how I love to talk about the origin stories. And I've caught some interesting clips from you um, in the past year. But let's let's hit the rewind button. And I heard you, you know, you were a hustler from day one at a young age. And I believe I heard you talking about a car wash competition when you were 11 years old. Well, was that your first memory of, you know, of, of business and maybe having a business mindset in an early age or does it go earlier than that? It'd be one of the earlier ones. That would be the, one of the earlier ones where I was actually making some good money for my age. I remember there was a kid, Eric, in the neighborhood who lived across the street and he started a car wash and I'm like, what a great idea. So I started a car wash across the street and we had a little price war. And so I was two bucks, he'd be a buck 75, then down to a buck 50. I think we ended up at 65 cents a car and Hmm. I was the cheapest. We were competing on price, but the nice thing about you're a kid is people would tip you and they'd still give you the full, full pop. So I was getting two bucks a car, except for one guy who washed his own car. He goes, you know what? There was a lineup. I did my own car. Here's the 65 cents anyways. That is a good, I mean, do you, do you remember, was there like a feeling, was there a spark that went off that said that really lit your fire moving forward? Was that the, was that the moment where like, Hey, I could create an opportunity that's going to generate money Mm -hmm. that I could use to buy stuff I want. Yeah. Well, I grew up with kids, sorry. I grew up with parents who my dad's a liver transplant surgeon. My mom's a realtor and they wanted me to earn my own money. So when we'd say as little kids, we want to go down to the candy store, the corner store, We had to buy it ourselves, And so we were able to go down and be like rock stars and buy whatever we wanted after this car wash. Make it rain for the kids in the neighborhood. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Candy, candy, candy. (laughs) And uh, we loved it. It was so much fun. So it was a sense of freedom. It was a sense of accomplishment. I love that we had to market the business. I brought on uh, two of my friends who were in the neighborhood, these girls. I had them with signs standing on the street corner, waving, you know, car wash, car wash, 65 cents. So we had to learn everything from marketing, sales, execution and production, managing the money. It was unbelievable. That's amazing. And the early, I mean, the early days of guerrilla marketing right there, street right street street marketing getting yeah. getting getting the word out there i love it which is interesting too because when you think about it and i've had similar conversations um with folks like gary v who um had this early entrepreneurial bug he was selling baseball cards at the time but he was also a, not the greatest student and i believe that's part of your story as well there too take us yeah. back to that time in 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 school and you know 
was it was it because your mind was was elsewhere? Was it was it a focus thing? I mean, I had similar problems too. I couldn't focus because my mind was always mm. in the future and trying to create mm. and do things. Yeah, you know, when I came to New York and met Gary V, you know, he and I, I think hit it off because we are similar that way. He's got some similar beliefs that college isn't for everyone. Now, find your way to learn. But if it isn't college as an entrepreneur and you're learning on the streets, I think that's how people like Gary and myself would have figured things out. I couldn't sit still. I'm so ADD. I mean, I'm if you see me, I'm always drinking a coffee because it helps literally instead of medication to help me focus. ADD in school, it wasn't that I didn't want to learn. I just had to be hyper, hyper interested in something to stay focused. Exactly. Same here. And and I had to have the right teacher, the right subject, the whole combination. So I didn't do well in school. I went to 14 schools, Adam, from kindergarten through to college. I didn't finish high school. I didn't finish college. I finished kindergarten. It's the only diploma I have. And uh, <laughs> moved from school to school. It was rough. So what, what was what was 14 to 18 year old Brian, you know, thinking about and doing at the time? Typical teenage things. I had my friends, girls. I had, you know, thinking about everything but college, everything but learning, just going out and having beer, having fun, whatever it took. And so I, I really, I love to learn. It just really didn't work for me. And so when I dropped out of the first time, when I dropped out of uh, high school, I said, okay, well, I want to go to college still because all my friends are going to college. I talked my way into college. I had to pay. Are you still my next question? Yeah, I had to pay for it, <laughs> and so I found a, a beat up old truck up, pickup truck in front of me, and a McDonald's drive through. It said Mark's hauling on the side. I looked at it, and I'm like, I need to do that. That's going to be my ticket to pay for. Yeah. So education. so so let's let, let's let's pause before we get to the 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 junk story origin story. And I'm I'm curious because I heard you on Jordan Harbinger's show, and Jordan's awesome. I had him I on my Jordan. show. He is an, another another client of Hala and Hala. Thank you for connecting all of us together. She is incredible there. Mm. But you said you, you know you were a class short of graduating at high school. How how did you actually talk your way into college? Well, who let you into college? The admissions office. So I went and knocked mm. on the door of the admissions office at the college near me and. I said, listen, I can do this. I'm smart enough. I might not have finished my Algebra 12 was the one class I needed to graduate. I said, please give me a chance. I can do this. I'm smart enough. And I had to sell them on it a few times. But they said, OK, here you go. We're letting you in. And uh, wow. I don't know if it, you know, so they gave me a chance. But I, I did end up leaving that school. I went to another one. I left that. Like, I just needed to confront so the brutal facts that school wasn't for me. And and was there that one moment? I mean, because a lot of people struggle, right? Because there's the the social element to it. There's the workload element to it. Was it going back to what you said before? Was it you're were you just not interested? Were you more interested in building something real at the time? You know, if you hit that rewind button. Yeah, I don't know if it was that I was interested in build something re building re something real. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. The spark for me that got that lit the fire for me to say big decision. Hey, Dad, I'm dropping out of school. I know you're not happy with it, but that's what I'm going to do. I said, I'm learning more about business by running a business, which I was doing during college, more than I was studying business. I had a marketing professor who had never run a business. And I said, you know, you're, you're smart, but I need to be out on the street learning from people that have done it. And that's what I did for myself. And how did, you know, your, your dad, what we'll call it a, you know, an academic being that he's a liver transplant surgeon mm -hmm. who went through extensive amounts of education. Yeah. How did that conversation go? Was he supportive of you? Did he understand? Did he see some early success and have the confidence and faith in you? Or did he push you to continue with college? Yeah, my dad was tough on me as a kid, not in a bad way. I think he really had high sort of expectations of my academic education. And it's funny, we had dinner last night together. He obviously loves what I'm doing now and is supportive and knows that I found a road less travel. Figured it all out. There. But <laughs> back in the day when I told him I was dropping out, he just thought I was nuts. He's like, Brian, you have one year left of your college education. Just finish it. Get her done. And I said, the opportunity with my business at the time was called the Rubbish Boys. That business opportunity might not be there forever. I'm going to do this business, see what I can make of it. And I can always go back to college if I desire. Yeah, I, you could, that's the other thing about college too, and especially now in these days, I love the idea of externships, the idea of taking that time, whether called a, a leap year, a break year, whatever, a gap year before deciding to go to school and either traveling the world or getting out into the workforce during internships and figuring things out and not just jumping into college. 
Because I think in this day and age, you don't necessarily need it. So again, we're going to hit the rewind button here and take us back to that McDonald's parking lot. You see this truck sitting there. Mm-hmm. What was what was that spark? Were you like, hmm? Was it like was it like a Rain Man kind of thing, Brian? Where you see numbers going on in your head? I could get a truck like that, maybe five hundred to a thousand dollars times X amount of hauls. I have to hire a few people. Is that how your brain works? And kind of that like visualizing numbers, Rain Man kind of way. When what what what, what happened in that <laughs> McDonald's parking lot? It was pretty simple. I saw the truck. I was trying to find a summer job at the time, and the employment market in Vancouver was really tough in the late 80s, early 90s. And I just was having trouble finding a job. So I saw this truck, Mark's hauling, plywood sides, filled with junk. And I'm like, I can go buy a truck. I can go haul junk like Mark and make some money to pay for college. That was it, plain and simple. And within a couple of weeks, I had a business. Within a couple of weeks later, I was making money and I was able to fund my college education that I talked my way into. So. It was pretty simple. This wasn't, Adam, this wasn't a, I am going to start a business that's going to be so big and roll in money. This was just a a way to pay for college. But then the spark went off and I started to see the possibility of, wow, this could be bigger. And one of those things for me was I was born in San Francisco. I would go down to visit my family in San Francisco. And I would see after I started the business, wow, they have junk trucks here too. So that Mm. light bulb started to go off of, this could be bigger than just Vancouver, and that seed was planted. Well, everyone's got junk. Everyone needs that junk removed. I mean, I literally have – we're doing home renovation right now, and I have two appliances that have been sitting in my kitchen. I've been waiting to move while we do the renovation, and I'm like, shit, I got to get my buddy over here to move it. Yeah. Everyone needs junk moved. Everyone needs it moved. But it's also a very, like, you know, blue-collar type of business, the actual business itself. It literally is a physical moving service. Mm-hmm. This isn't some crazy computer software product. This isn't something crazy. But how did you differentiate it early? How would you, how are you going to be different than the other junk haulers out there? Was it the marketing? Was it the customer service? What was those early lessons you learned that helped really lay the foundation for the franchise uh, and the operations today? Mm-hmm. So customer experience was always a big thing for me. And I don't think anyone taught me. I just had it in my 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 mind, my heart, whatever you want to call it. You know, when I, I used to work at my grandparents' army surplus store in San Francisco every school break I could. And when I would work in their shop, what I learned from them, a story, one of my favorite stories is everyone Please. in that neighborhood, they were at a dodgy end of town. Everyone got robbed. All the stores, all the time. My grandparents- That's the way of life. My grandparents never got robbed. And the reason they didn't get robbed is- People would come in, the homeless, people that lived on the street, and they would ask for something. They'd ask for money, and my my grandparents would not give them money, but they'd give them what they really needed, a hug, an ear. They'd listen to them. And I saw how they treated the community and the fact that they never got robbed. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. Just take care of people. I'm wearing this hat today. It's all about people. That's it. That's what the world needs. Just focus on people and taking care of each other. And that's the magic. And so I was inspired to how do I do that in the junk business? Show up with a smile, show up on time, do what I say I'm going to do, thank the customer, all the little things, but it really made a big and still makes a big difference. I mean, that goes, I I don't know if it's people aren't executing on it these days or it's why is it so hard to see that the people that are winning in business are the ones that are kind, that lead with empathy, that lead with people first. And understanding that your people who work for you are your product and your customers are vital, it's not that complicated. Stop chasing the dollar and start just focusing on the people and the money will come, right? Be human. You know, one one experience I remember was Starbucks, a brand I love. Obviously, I'm a big coffee guy. And Starbucks has great customer experience. Their baristas treat you like people. But I was really impressed one day. You know how they always ask for your, what's your name for the cup? And yeah, you write down Adam. This one woman said, before I ask for your name, let me let you know that my name is, what's your name for the cup? I just like that she made it even more human instead of me feeling like just, what's your name? What's your name? It was, oh, hi, I'm so-and-so, and and what's your name? And a little touch that I thought was magical. And so it is those little things. People do business with people they like. Why not be like It's not that complicated. It's not, it's not that complicated. No. And I mean, I think that's really a cornerstone for my success. I mean, before I got into recruiting, I worked in account management for 
for ad agencies. And it comes down to managing expectations, managing emotions, and just being a human. What was that What was that first moment where you knew you were on the right track with this business and you felt truly successful, that you made it, that you were onto something, Brian? It has been like a bunch of stairs that you would climb that just keep on going, almost a never-ending set of stairs where you just keep looking back at the view and going, look at how far I've come. Now look how far I've come. And you keep looking back. So first it was making a, a profit in the business and going, wow, I can pay for college on my own without any government loans, without any support from my, my parents. But then it became, wow, we've added a second truck. We've added five trucks. Mm -hmm. We're now not just in Vancouver, but we expanded to Seattle. We franchised. We've gotten on the Oprah Winfrey show. We've gotten on the Ellen DeGeneres show. Like it just keeps growing and growing and growing. And I think that's what I love about entrepreneurship. As ADD as I am, I can still sit there and look up at the stairs and go, man, I've got a long ways to go and I can't even see the top. And I can always look back and recognize, look where we've come from. I love that. So for you, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, and I think, is it, is it not, not so much goal setting, but just just being in love with the journey? It's or do you have the goal? Do you have goals? It's being in love with the journey. Oh, I've got tons of goals. And so what it is for me is I love setting a goal. So let's take Ellen DeGeneres as an example. We put it in our vision, our painted picture about, I don't know, 15 to 20 years ago. And it never happened. We got on the Oprah Winfrey show in 14 months after just chasing that goal. But Ellen, we couldn't make happen. Somebody in my company, Nadine Farley, decided to try and make it happen. And during COVID, she pitched Ellen and pitched, finally broke through. And we, what I love about that is these big goals, it's not me making them happen. I get to plant a seed of what can you imagine for the business to change the world? What are we doing? And we dream big, but others go out and make it happen. So I feel like I get to plant these seeds of possibility and get others inspired to plant their own seeds of possibility. I love it. And then they chase them. But it's the journey, man. It's it's the journey. And and there's such a leadership lesson within there. Have you always been a natural leader of people or was that a evolution for you? Yeah, yeah, it's a good story. So five years into my business, this will show you that I have not always been a natural leader. I had 11 people in my business, half a million in revenue. They say one bad apple spoils the whole bunch. I think I had nine of the 11 were bad apples. Now, not bad people. <laughs> they just weren't the right people for me. And they right. just didn't love the no, business. No. So I took all 11 and I said, the only way forward is starting again. And I brought them in a room, all 11 at once. And I said, I'm sorry. I, as a leader, have let you down. I didn't find the right people, treat you right. I don't know how to make this work other than starting again. And I freed them up for a better opportunity and got myself finding the right people from there moving forward. And that's where this hat was, wow. was it's all about people. Find the right people and treat them right. I, as a leader, was hiding in my office. I was staying away from people. I didn't want to connect with them. I didn't like them. I didn't like myself. This was then going, okay, how can I grow as a leader? And that would be one of my biggest single steps as a leader in recognizing that how I treat my people, our people, is going to be the key moving forward. And that's an incredible self-awareness course correction there. And, and, and I think everyone has those, well, every successful leader has that epiphany. Very few are just born just to be amazingly natural born leaders. It's a, it's, a, it's a muscle memory, it's a skill, it takes lots of failures, lots of trials and errors. And listen, sometimes people get hurt along the way. You get hurt along the way, yeah. but it's how you manage that experience, um, you know, for others. Something interesting, you know, I read that, you know, you've turned down multiple offers from uh, some, some big companies trying to acquire you, waste management executives. Everyone's seen those big trucks out there, big money out there. And you turned it down multiple times because from what I read, the business is your dream and running and fulfilling, it was understandable. Was there any point where you really thought about it? Did they ever put a, such a big ass check in front of you where it made it really hard? Uh, no, I don't think about it because I'm not done and I don't think our team will be done. We love what we're building, how we're building it and who we're building it with. I don't want to give it to someone else for any chunk of money. I mean, to me, it's a bit like a baby. Like, would you, would you sell off your, you've got kids, I've got kids. Would you sell them off? Maybe, maybe on a bad day. De but, depends on the day. Right? I'll maybe rent them out. Exactly. <laughs> But I love what I'm building yeah. and the potential for building it. So a quick story was waste management. They took me out on a boat, 
beautiful world-class fishing resort and we're away from shore there's two of us in a bus side, side, side note side note i don't mean to interrupt you ever get scared in the waste management industry when someone wants to take you out on a boat exactly it was a little soprano-ish <laughs> you know there there were three of us in a boat sorry to, me to interrupt but i had to ask no, no, but it's true and we were so far from shore that i didn't right. even know which direction shore was and they said listen we want to buy your company let's do this together and and great guys and i've kept in touch with with them and they offered me big money, like a hundred million bucks. Small company at the time. I could have retired and never worked again in a day in my life. That's not what I wanted. And I said, guys, listen, you could offer me 10 times. You could offer me a billion dollars and I would still say no. I love what I'm building, who I'm building it with. The world is filled with opportunity and I'm not, I'm not even close to done. So I said no and walked away. And they understood when I said a billion dollars, something ridiculous that would not make any sense. They're like, wow, this guy's really committed. He's committed. Yeah, so let's flip that story around. And I found your aqua hire um, of the folks at the Leap back in 2017 to be interesting. So when you think of trash companies, it doesn't really scream Silicon Valley. Right. If you don't mind explaining like how that deal came together and how you started to think about you know, incorporating more of the tech side into the business. Yeah, we found a guy with a, a novel idea that was working in San Francisco, a guy named Nate, and he started this company, mm -hmm. Delete, where it was really text us a picture of your junk, we'll text you a price, boom. The model didn't work for him. He ran out of cash. We thought we could help. We still couldn't really make it work. I think there's some bolt-on technology that we can do with our business and we'll we'll figure out how to make that work, but we're not there. Um, we tried. So we tried to get into the tech world a little bit more. Now, in many ways, we're a tech company. If you were to walk around the junction, our office and look at any of our businesses, Shack Shine, Wow One Day or 1-800-GOT-JUNK, you'd go, wow, this feels a lot like a tech company, open office environment, lots of fun right. and energy. Um, our technology is what makes us able to do this. If you think 1-800-GOT-JUNK, one phone number, one website, simple, we connect the world point. with junk, yeah, you know, getting rid of junk and it's easy. So we, we've got a tech-based focus, but we're not the uh, the Elon Musks of the world trying to, you know, have electric trucks everywhere. We'll get there one day, but technology is a friction reducer for us. It helps make things easier for the customers and uh, it works. Well, it's a beautiful point of point of entry. I mean, if you think about local, I mean, talk about my situation, it's brand recognition. I need to get rid of something. I could either go back to the penny saver. I could ask somebody for a recommendation or I could go to the first thing that comes to mind is, is, is got junk. And I want to talk about across all of your companies, you have this way of communicating your services in a brand that's really visual and distinctive. Does that come from your background and your approach or has that been from learning from, you know, smart marketing people around you? Yeah, smart people all over. I mean, yeah, what influences you? Yeah, we've who influences got, you as far as branding? You know what? I love brands. So first of all, to answer your first question, I think it comes from me. I think it's my ability to have fun with brands and to have them connect. I love the brands that I use, whether it be Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Starbucks, um, Swell water bottles, whatever. I, you know, I just I, mm -hmm. I like brands and how they position themselves. And so I've gotten out there and said, how can we make our brands likable, lovable, and make them easy for our customer? So who inspires me? It's it's other. You know, Howard Schultz, who I've had the pleasure to meet several times. I just love how he created the third place. Right, you've got your home, you've got your office, you've got this third place to go and hang out and connect with people and do work all over coffee. And so brands right. change the world when done right. Netflix, um, Reed Hastings. I mean, it, it's crazy what these guys have done. Right place, right time, smart people, great branding, the combination. I love it all. The podcast is brought to you in partnership with Venturi, the recruitment operating system, the all-in-one tech platform purposely built for recruitment and staffing to unify your front, middle, and back office operations. Venturi is designed by recruiters for recruiters. Both the company and the platform are the unique creations of successful recruiters who sold their business, saw a need for a better recruitment tech, and made it happen. And if you're looking to upgrade your recruitment tech and give your recruiters a new modern operating system, visit venturi.io slash podcast. That's V-I-N-C-E-R-E dot I-O backslash P-O-Z-C-A-S-T for an exclusive offer. Thanks. So let's talk about expansion. With these, you know, you talk about um, 
you know, Wow One Day Painting and, and Shack Shine, were these natural extensions? Where do extensions get birth from? And is there ever like a right time to do it? I mean, listen, I just launched a, a second company a month ago and I said, screw it, right time, right place, white space opportunity, I'm just gonna go for it. What's the mindset behind it? Or is it a little bit more business driven, uh, you know, from the numbers? Well, I think for me, for us, it's first and foremost, making sure we're ready. So we waited over 20 years, 21 years before we got into our second business, Wow One Day Painting. Wow. And I had someone come in and paint my home. It was a little serendipitous. I had three quotes. The first two come in, cigarette smoke, late. You know, they're going to move in and sort of Murphy Brown my house. And I said, listen. <laughs> Murphy Brown reference. Yeah. So, uh, so I said, listen, like this third guy that comes in, Jim, was so unbelievable. Clean cut, professional, shiny van. He said, I'm going to paint your house in a day. My pricing is awesome. My quality is amazing. Here's the deal. And I said, in a day, mm. how's that even possible? And he said, well, it's our, kind of our secret sauce, but we'll get her done. Turned out it wasn't that much of a secret. You put enough painters, you know, one room can be painted by one person in a day, a big room, two people in a day. So I had 16 people in my house. No one was bumping into each other. They had separate rooms mm -hmm. and projects to do, and it was coordinated perfection. And I said, I got to buy this company it. and I got to grow this. And, uh, you know, we've got almost 100 franchise partners today building a massive, massive brand in home painting. And so when was the right time? It was serendipitous. It felt right. And it wasn't too soon. I see a lot of companies get out there and try and start a whole bunch of things at once and see what sticks. Your business ideas need your time and attention and focus solely on that one thing until you build enough momentum. So that's an interesting that's an interesting lesson there. And it comes down to efficiency, too. It's interesting to talk about the painting. You know, we're doing housework now and I always say. You throw a couple more men at the job, you get it done faster, you're able to move on to the next job where your profits can increase. I mean, there's a balance there mm. and you have to figure out the formula that that works for you. Um, and, and that kind of leads me to my next one about systemizing, you know, the growth of your business. Can you talk a little bit about like how you create and, and implement those systems? Yeah. So inspired by Michael Gerber's book, The E-Myth Revisited the best book on the planet on how to systematize your business. Michael's become a friend. I think he's like 84 years old now. Unbelievable guy. He saw how we applied the e-myth to our business. He goes, Brian, I got to come to Vancouver and see it. And he walked through our business and he goes, I've never seen anybody implement it in this way. In the same way that you get on a plane and a pilot has a checklist to ensure mm -hmm. every single thing is done right each and every time. Um, you don't just depend on your memory. We've put a lot of checklists and systems into our business to say, how do we guarantee results and consistency? People tell us all the time, Brian, your 1-800-GOT-JUNK team members are awesome. They get that feeling because every single city, every single time it's done right. Now we're not perfect, of course we make mistakes, but it's done pretty exceptionally because of systems and processes, how you find the right people, how you train the right people, and how they operate the business each and every day. Go read the read the e-myth. I'm going to I'm going to read it. I'm going to put it on audio book and, and let it absorb into my don't piece of here. But let's talk about systemizing when it comes to hiring. I mean, the root of the show is telling you this. This show started about talent, people mm -hmm. hiring. Mm -hmm. How do you balance consistency in hiring with also ensuring that you're finding the right people based on their soft skills in addition to the hard skills mm -hmm. that they have? How do, you, how do you identify talent and make good hires? Yeah, so let me share What's my- your secret sauce? Yeah, let me share my philosophy and then I'm curious what you think as someone who's a recruiter. I found that hiring was something I stopped enjoying. I was okay at it for sure, but I really stopped liking it because it was, Brian, you needed all these processes, ask these people these questions, you're in a burning building and there's a cat jumping in and blah, blah, you know, like no hypothetical things, but more getting into someone's real past and starting to d dig and dig and dig. And, and I felt like, you know what, people are so good at building amazing looking resumes and selling themselves and telling stories about all the great stuff. Right. Not enough people fess up to their weaknesses. And so I, I found I found it was challenging interviewing people. So I decided to sit down and pretend I was having a beer with someone and just get to know them. Find out what makes them tick. What do they love to do? What would make this the ideal job? What's wrong with this job? What's wrong with them? And and just get to know what they're interested in. And and so I would would I have a beer with this person? Are they interested, interesting? Do we have a shared common passion and um and a connection? And just let them let their guard down a little bit. And so we do that with our people. We get people to actually, when they're interview, put them through the beer and the barbecue test. Would you have a beer with them? Mm -hmm. 
Is there a connection? The barbecue test is how would they show up at a company party, picnic, barbecue? Would they fit in? Do they add to the environment? They don't have to be big extroverts. They can be introverts, but are they adding something? Right. Making it better. Oh, well, that, well, that, well that, that was my next kind of point too. And, and, and generally speaking, I think this is a pretty good philosophy. I also think that depending on the size of the company and certain skills and jobs that are required, sometimes you might need somebody who could actually get the job done yep. that maybe you don't need to hang out with. And, and that's kind of a one-off thing. Yeah. And I, I also believe, and 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 I hope you don't take this the wrong way, I, I don't use the word fit. I removed the word fit from my vocabulary yeah. when it comes to hiring because I truly believe that companies should really be a, a quilt, right? Mm-hmm. It should be culture harmony, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. People are different textiles, they're different mm-hmm. strains, mm-hmm. they're different, made out of different backgrounds, different colors, different feels. Totally. But when you put them all together, Brian- yeah. And you pull back and you look at it, you have this beautiful quilt in, in front of you. So I think we're saying something very similar. Yeah. And But how important is it to have to like somebody? And this is, a, this is an important one, especially in this day and age where a lot of companies are going remote. And I don't know with your specific company, you know, with the pandemic is remote. How important is it this days versus getting shit done? Yeah. So first of all, I 100% agree with you. Fit isn't the best word. Uh, to me, it's add. Do they add to? I like the ad. The ad is important. Yeah, the ad's important. Diversity of opinions, backgrounds, style, everything. Mindset. Yeah, 100%. So introverts, extroverts, all sorts of different people, they've got to be different and interesting and they've got to add and make our world a better place. So we love people that can come and challenge the status quo, people that can argue over a point professionally, people that can say, Brian, you're not right. Have you thought about it this way? So I love all that and 100% um, believe in and follow that practice. To me, it's just in a virtual world as well, where it's a little challenging, uh, people that will speak up and and they can chat up. They don't have to necessarily speak up on Zoom, but they can put it in the chat. They just need to share what they're thinking and tell us and keep it real. And um, it's not that everybody has to get along, but everything's better by having that person in there. Yeah, and I love that too. And I've had conversations with other CEOs where that's a really strong point. They look for people who aren't scared to speak up and challenge them because you don't want yes men and yes women. No. You don't want it because you, you, listen, a lot of times you have your blinders on. When you have so many things going on in your business, in your life, you need these people to be looking out for your six. You got to, they got to have your back and they have to be able to step up and say, Brian, you're missing an opportunity. You're not seeing something. Mm -hmm. Here's what's happening internally. And you want people who have the, uh, the fortitude to be able to do that, especially at a senior level. Absolutely. I mean, if you want yes people, you're not going to grow your company. You're going to be a genius with a thousand helpers versus someone who's empowering your people to be leaders and grow and develop. Um, I love when we can plant a seed of a vision of where we're going. We have no idea how to get there and turn someone loose and just say, yeah, we don't know how we're going to do this. Maybe you do. And just... Just figure it out. Exactly. Just figure it out. You want people to figure it out too. And that's another common thread I hear when I'm interviewing decision makers is you want people who show examples of how they, show me your thinking behind this. Not just tell me your accomplishments, but how did you figure it out? What were your challenges? How did you handle the objections? Mm -hmm. How do you handle a strong objection from a client? How do you handle internal discourse? I think it's important. Let's switch gears for a moment and talk about your PR strategy. Um, I I heard a clip of you on Hawk Talk with Eric Kuberman, Mm -hmm. who's who's been on my show too, is a buddy of mine. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong here. So basically you reach out to writers, for example, to pitch a story. And if they turn you down, you ask what would make it a better story. So you challenge them back. Yeah. So what I'm trying to do is I'm not trying to convince them by any means. So if I call the USA Today reporter and they say, you know, it's just not a fit. It's not going to work for us. I don't say what would make it a better story. I actually say what's missing. Why isn't mm-hmm. it a story? Now, journalists generally think fairly similarly. And they'll tell me, well, you know, it doesn't have a human interest angle. It, it's it's been told a million, excuse me, a million times. Or they'll tell me what's wrong, and I'll say, okay, great, thank you. You've given me some stuff to think about. I take that thinking. I then go to the New York Times, and the New York Times goes, wow, this is awesome. We love it. So all I'm doing it, I'm not trying to sell someone. I'm trying to learn from that expert. And people want to share their opinions and they'll tell me. I mean, people have no problem telling a stranger on the phone, here's why it's not a story, but they give you a nugget that you just go, wow, I got it. Yeah, the golden. What, what has been in, in your in your you know esteemed career, what has been your biggest mistake with the press? I don't know if we've ever had any big mistakes. Maybe a misstep, maybe, maybe a lesson that you would give. Yeah, I, 
I mean, the, the lesson for me is just don't be afraid of failing. My, my first book was called WTF, Willing to Fail. And that book talks all about the failures and the learning take you to a better place if you can be open to that. So the press, sometimes I feel like we're failing and failing and failing and failing and then boom. I mean, we must have pitched the Ellen DeGeneres show 30 or 40 times, but we kept listening and we kept listening to their feedback and we were determined. Tweaking, not giving up. And eventually it happened. And do they feel like we're pests? No, I think at the end of the day, Ellen and I had a connection on visioning, on manifesting. And she, I got to meet her the first time and she's like, Brian, my entire life has been possibilities coming to life. I plant these seeds and boom. And so when I was able to tap into that with her and go, well, then let's do a story on possibility. So two weeks ago, we were on the Ellen Show trying to build a Can You Imagine movement, a movement where we've got a big wall in our office called Can You Imagine? Can you imagine if we're on Oprah and Ellen? Can you imagine if we're on the side of Starbucks cups worldwide with these quotes uh, that they would normally have famous authors and athletes? And we had a quote on there. So big things, big dreams. How do we make those happen? Ellen is helping us build a movement by being on her show. Uh, We're going to uh, a fellow Durrell who's a band leader at a school in Washington, D.C. And we're going to help their students build a can you imagine wall big dreams they can walk past every day and you never know they might actually make those things happen i love it and i couldn't i couldn't agree more and brian my philosophy i call it i call it and no one no one really calls it this but me is posner's three p's of success which is patient polite persistence Mm -hmm. you keep at it you do it the right way Mm -hmm. you stay on top of it and you manifest it you don't give up right away Yes, you don't give up. No, totally. And and Steve Jobs talked about this as connecting the dots. You can't connect the dots moving forward because nobody can predict the future. But looking back, you can say that politeness, that interaction I had, very professional and persistent with someone. It was all these little dots that connected. And some of them are failures, but they connected towards making something big happen in the future. And it's so funny, too, because people think at times that they failed at something, but they actually left somebody with such a good impression that it was a success. Mm -hmm. And they overlook that. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of a big epiphany to me over the last couple of years when I saw seeds that I planted that I thought weren't growing, Mm -hmm. but they were just growing very slowly. And when I came back to add a little bit more water, they sprouted. And I was like, holy shit, look at that relationship. Look at that referral. Look at that introduction. Well, it's like, what do they call it? A super bloom in um, Death Valley every 75 years. So those seeds are there. They need the right conditions and then boom, they grow. So sometimes it takes 75 years for something to bloom. You got to be patient in this world. It's one of uh, Posner's P's, right? And it- Right, Posner's three P's. Posner's three P's. There we go. So I, I love it. And I think that people aren't patient enough. Big things- Patience- yeah, my, my company, look at my businesses. People come up and, and they're like, oh, Brian, you've built this thing so quickly. It's inspiring. I go, quickly? Dude, it's 30 been 33 years. years. It took me eight years to get to a million in revenue. Yes, we do a million dollars in the morning sometimes, but it took eight years to get to that first million. It's been slow. People overlook that. So I want, I want to talk about the book writing process for a little bit. What have you learned about yourself from writing two books? What have, what have you learned? Not from those, the business perspective, Brian, but the, the personal journey of writing a book. I hear, I hear it's pretty intense. Yeah, it's intense, but I've learned it's worth it. It's very valuable. I've learned that every single person has stories to tell. And if they can figure out how to tell them and share them with the world. I, I've known a lot of authors, people we would all know, friends and entrepreneurs who, who write a book because of themselves. And it's their ego and they mm. want to be an author and they want to be a New York Times bestselling author and all that. And that's great to have those goals. Helps them on the talking circuit, right? Yeah. yeah. And, th- and that's great to have those goals. But how it worked for me was Roy H. Williams, the wizard of ads. He does all our radio creative. He said to me, year after year after year for eight years, I'd go visit him in Austin. And he said, you got to write a book, Brian. Got to write a book. When are you going to write a book? And I just said, Roy, like, I don't want to write a book. My ego doesn't need a book. I'm too busy to do a book. I I, I can't imagine why it would be important. And he said, Brian, it isn't about you. It's about those who you will tell stories with and share your companies and your people's stories that will inspire others and make their life better. He said, it will make an impact, I promise you. And I was like, wow, will it really? 40,000 books later with WTF. And all the reviews and thoughts and emails, I'm like, wow, it did make a difference. So much so that 
we wrote a second book and we're going to write a third. And so it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Someone who was so such a naysayer on I don't need to write a book. I don't want to write a book. I saw the impact it's had on people, the inspiration, the ideas. And uh, Roy was right. It was worthy. I love it. So let's talk about the uh, the, the latest book, BYOB, Build Your, Your Own Business, Be Your Own Boss. If you want somebody to walk away with one thing after reading that, what is it? Yeah. So so this is the book. And what's interesting is it just launched yesterday on Amazon. It hit number one on entrepreneurship. This is actually the cover. So Amazon hasn't sent me a book yet because it's all print on demand. So this is just a cover on top of my old book. Uh, so I can't wait to actually- So they sent you a cover. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can't wait to get the copy myself. So the one takeaway, here's what I would want. WTF was lessons learned through our stories, through our businesses. And someone had to be interested in 1-800-GOT-JUNK or Wow One Day to want to read our stories. This one is a more general entrepreneurship encouragement type book where I say BYOB, build your own business, be your own boss. If somebody has dreamt of being their own boss for years and building a business but has never taken the left, the leap. They say 66% of Americans have had the dream. And um, I want to inspire people to go from dreaming into taking action, taking the first step. So I take people through my journey of mentors I've met along the way, Simon Sinek, Fred DeLuca, who started Subway, Shaquille O'Neal, different people I've these. been able to meet and talk business with. Here's what I've learned. And so here's two paths. Someone can start a business, blank sheet it, totally from scratch like I did, a million dollars after eight years, or they can start a proven formula, take a proven recipe and say, ah, I want to follow someone else's recipe, do it my way, do it better, grow quicker. So I contrast the the two and I, and I think I give a fair comparison to both. It doesn't matter to me at the end of the day, Adam, if somebody starts their own business with us with someone else, another franchise on their own. I just want people to live their dream. I, and, and I love it too. And that's such an interesting point too, because I was about to ask you what, what what's one of the core benefits of, of getting into a franchise, especially if you haven't started one before. Not everybody has a DNA, the background to build a business from scratch. I mean, you right. literally just answered the question. So getting involved with something that's proven, that's systemized, and that's what you're paying into. What So, so what makes your franchise model better should i say than others if so, say i'm like shit maybe i'll open a dunkin donuts maybe i'll open a subway or a papa john's but you know what let me let me let me let me do a, a, a got junk franchise why should i go in that direction i think we treat people like people we develop them here you know here's our core belief with all our businesses people say the customer's always right and that's the core philosophy in a business i disagree i think your people are always right so we say take care of your people and they will take care of the customer. Take care of the customer and they will take care of the growth of your brand, your profits, your reputation. And so for me, it's all about people and we've built a culture, a family, we've built this, we're bigger and better together approach. We are a business based around people. That's all we are. So when we're hauling someone's junk away or washing someone's windows, it's smiley, friendly people that show up and the customer just goes, you guys are awesome. This is amazing. Stuff. So it's the culture more than anything, but not everybody is right for a franchise. I don't think you or I, I haven't known you for very long, but I think you and I probably aren't franchise partners. We are solo entrepreneurs, get out there from a start, build a team, do it from scratch as a blank sheet. I didn't stick read with, our people. I didn't stick with school. I, I mean, I, I can't follow rules in the same way that other people can. Now, systems and processes, someone, you know, we've had people come from military backgrounds who go, my whole life's been following rules and processes and systems and being told, here's the way, train, execute. Um, someone who comes into a franchise, Paul Guy started a, the first 1-800-GOT-JUNK franchise. It took me eight years to get to a million. It took him one year to get to a million because he had a great proven recipe and executed with yep. excellence. He's doing over a hundred million today with all his franchises. That's incredible. And so... It just depends. It's got to be a personality fit for sure. It absolutely does. That's fantastic. So let's break it home here, Brian. This has been a fantastic conversation. Fun. And for me, this show is my masterclass. You know, I've recorded almost 225 episodes with incredible people, leaders, entrepreneurs, people that have all been successful. And the question that I love to ask, 
What is the single greatest piece of advice you've ever received that you take action on every single day? Mm. So Greg Brophy started a company called Shreddit, billion dollar plus shredding company. And I called him up one day with some challenges I was having and he became a mentor and he's since passed on, but incredible human being. And he said the most impactful piece of advice he was ever given, which he then gave that gift to me, was never, ever, ever, ever compromise on the quality of people you bring into your organization. And I follow that constantly. I am so careful. I'm not always right. We had a, we had a fellow recently that we brought into the company uh, maybe six months ago. And I was the only person on the group of interviewers that said, I, I just, I don't have a feeling. This isn't, this, my gut says no. This person has turned out to be a rock star of rock stars. I'm not always right, but I'm careful. And we really are careful who we let into our organization to make sure that they add in a big way and challenge us and make us as an overall organization better. And that is fantastic advice. And last but not least, you know, you look back on on your career mm -hmm. and your life and listen, not everything has been sunshine and roses. There's been some tough days, some tough times, some tough weeks, months, years. And during those times, you really had to dig down deep and really harness that inner tenacity and pull yourself up. And on the flip side of that, Brian, when you sit here today in uh, up in, in Vancouver and in, in, in Northwestern uh, Canada over there, and you're just filled with gratitude mm -hmm. and you look back at this life and family that you created, mm -hmm. you've built so many amazing lives for other people. You've empowered them. Mm -hmm. What keeps you focused in life? What keeps you going in the right direction? Brian Scudamore, what is your North Star in life? People. I believe in people. I have so much fun with people. We did our first annual kickoff again in person. It's been two Good. years and we just came back from Vegas where 750 of us got together and hug and shake hands and high fives. And it was so wonderful to see all these entrepreneurs in person again. That's what keeps me going is people wanting to make the world a better place, wanting to make their people better. And I get to play just a tiny, tiny, tiny little role in it. And I'm so grateful for that. I love it. And I'm grateful for you taking the time to spend with me and my audience today. Hang with me for one moment here as I sign off for everyone. Please check out mywtfbook.com and o2ebrands.com. Brian, where else can people find you, connect with you and learn more? If they want to check out BYOB, um, go to Amazon. I mean, biggest bookstore in the world. And where else would I sell it? It, it is there. Brian, hang with me for one moment here. I, I greatly appreciate you and your time so much. Good and fun. everyone out there listening, I hope you learned a ton a ton from Brian. This is what it's all about, well, learning. And, and Adam, you know what? I, I learn a ton. I love doing podcasts with great people who have such awesome energy because you get you ask me questions that get me reflecting on things I might not have thought about or in a different way. So I learned a ton. Thank you. Wow, I appreciate that too. And everyone out there, remember, you know where you could find more, thepodcast.com. Follow us on all the social media channels. Most importantly, remember to take care of each other, look out for one another, and catch us next week for another great episode of the podcast. Take care, everybody. Wisdom is forever. But for us, it's time to go. Thank you for joining us. Luckily, we'll be back with our next episode soon, jam-packed with more incredible humans. Thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing. To join the conversation, search The podcast on LinkedIn. And to catch up on past episodes and more info, please visit www.thepausecast.com. <laughs>